Hey y'all, welcome back for more Bio 20, week number 14, the start. We're talking ecosystems, and here are our objectives, along with what we're doing today. So when we need to control populations, it's important to consider two the two forms. So we have exponential and logistic growth. Exponential growth is the one that goes straight up. Logistic growth is the one that kind of levels off over time. And we know that this happens namely because we ran out of resources. The question is, is that like the only thing you can do is just, oops, we ran out of stuff? And the answer is, of course not. There turn out to be two different ways that we can see that populations get controlled. One of them is referred to as a density-independent manner. So independent meaning it has nothing to do with density. Density meaning population size. So this would be something that's like a natural disaster. So if you have a drought or a flood or it gets really hot or really cold or there's a fire or you know an asteroid you know hits into the earth, you can't really do anything about that. It has nothing to do with how big the population is or not. You know, a fire doesn't care. Fire is a fire. So we can't predict when these happen. We can't stop them when they do. This is in contrast to what we would call a density dependent factor, which is population size does matter. So this can occur because you're fighting for resources. We call that competition. It could be due to things eating other things, so predation, or parasites and disease, which is what you're going to be doing in lab with epidemiology for this week. So diseases spread if you let them, and it turns out disease is a really good way of controlling population size. This graph here is from your book, and it looks at age of, um, I think it's, oh, what is it? Some type of elk or antelope or something like that, and mortality rate. And what we tend to see is those in high-density populations, mean lots of numbers, tend to die a lot more than those in low density. And the reason why is disease. It's all about disease in this particular case. Populations are all well and good and fine, but they only make sense when we start sticking them into other populations. So when populations meet, we call those communities. Much like with species, it's going to be in the same space and at the same time, and we get different levels of interactions when we make communities exist. Some of those interactions are what we call predation or herbivory. So predation is animal on animal. Herbivory is an animal eating plant, or it could be a fungus that does that, but usually that's more of a parasitic phenomenon. We can have competition, so when you're fighting for those resources, and it's different species fighting for, I don't know, access to trees or water, what have you. The thing with competition is it is what we would call a negative-negative interaction, meaning the result of it is both sides usually have some type of injury or they waste their time or something like that. It's not a good phenomenon, competition, even though it happens. We could also have symbioses, which is life dealing with life. So you have a mutualistic relationship where the two benefit from each other. So think of things like, if you've ever seen Finding Nemo, you have the sea anemone and then you have the clownfish. It turns out that's a mutualistic relationship. The uh, sea anemone provides protection for the clownfish, and the clownfish keeps it safe and will also kind of ward off predators. Commensalism is a form of interaction where one benefits and the other doesn't really notice or care. So, like, we have skin mites on us that eat our skin, you know, dead flaky skin. We don't know it. They don't hurt us, but, you know, they get a source of food, so it's commensalism. And then you have parasitism, which is one is explicitly benefiting on the behalf of the other, which is suffering. And obviously, during all these, organisms will fight back. So, like, this particular plant here is called a honey locust, and you'll notice these particularly nasty-looking spikes. So this is a fight back against herbivory. Same thing with this one here, which is foxglove. Foxglove has a whole bunch of chemicals in it that mess with your brain and it messes with your heart 
So you eat it and you're probably going to get sick, if not die, from it. So it's a way of saying, don't eat me. I also get other patterns like this. So we can have what we call a postmatic coloration, or we get this bright coloration. And this turns out to be a way of saying, I'm dangerous, so please don't you dare because bright colors tend to be seen, especially when they're yellows and blues. We also see that with this one here, so this is a wasp. But we also get some parasitism that occurs when it comes to the coloration. And the parasitism is one has to build the relationship, or the you build up the persona, the fear, and the other benefits. This one right here turns out to be a fly. And this is actually a phenomenon called Batesian mimicry, where a harmless species mimics a harmful species. Um, wasps follow what we also call Malarian mimicry, which is they all kind of, you know, these stinging insects kind of have similar body plans, so you've been stung by one and you know, hey, stay away from them all. It's in part what, like, this bright coloration is going for. This is an example of competition. So if we were to grow two different species of paramecia, um, you can see that we get this really nice logistic growth curve. But when we mix them together, it turns out one of them suffers. But this one suffers too, because you don't get a nice growth curve like you would see when it was by itself. Both species do turn out to be harmed, even though one is clearly the winner. This here is dealing with a tapeworm, so Tanaya species. And this one is obviously a parasite, so the tapeworm lives inside of the intestinal tract. And the result is it takes you the nutrients that you work hard to digest, and it just gets the free ride. So it benefits while you suffer. This here is an example of mutualism. This is actually a three-way mutualism. So there are plants that are found, so it's this particular species of plant that lives in the ground in Yellowstone National Park. So your body's at 37 Celsius, so need to say 55 C is really, really hot. And it turns out the plant can't normally grow there. But the plant, if it is colonized by a fungus, it will survive. But it turns out you can't just use any old version of this fungus. This fungus itself needs to have a viral infection. And it turns out this viral infection allows this fungus to survive, which will allow the plant to survive. All three need each other. Because if you take the fungus away from the plant, the fungus dies. Take the fungus away from the plant, the plant dies. Virus doesn't reproduce in anything other than that fungus. When we look at communities, it turns out they have varying levels of stability. And we can define like your job in that community as what we call an ecological niche. So the niche, this word here, is your job. It's your role. It's evolution. You have evolved into this one slot. So you are a producer. You are a consumer. You are a recycler. But when you're a producer, you are a producer in this environment. Or you are a consumer, but only of these things. And you are consumed by these things, but not other things. You could also be deemed to be either a foundation or a keystone species. A foundation species provides the environment for others in that community. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're a community of a whole bunch of plants and a lot of them are, sh you know, they don't like sun, like they don't react well in sunlight, well then the foundation would be the large trees that maintain the shade. That would make it a foundation. It provides the ability for the others to survive. The keystone species, on the other hand, 
maintains the stability of the ecosystem, or excuse me, of the community. To which case you're going to say, well, that sounds awfully close to that foundation. And the answer, no, not it's not quite the same thing, even though they sound similar. And I'll show you an example of it in a moment. This here turns out to be an example of a keystone. So if you were to have, you know, a kelp forest, so you're going to have sea urchins that are going to eat kelp, you have the kelp, you have otters that eat the urchins and other things. It turns out it's the kelp that provides the environment. So the kelp is the foundation. And if I get rid of the kelp, you'll still have urchins, you'll still have sea otters and all that stuff. If you get rid of the urchins, you still have kelp, you still have sea otters. However, if you get rid of the sea otter, the result is the kelp will die off and all you're going to be left with is nothing but sea urchins. So the community, which is all three of those, collapses until there's only one thing left. The keystone, in this particular case, is the one that keeps... is one that keeps the sea urchins at bay. Communities obviously will change over time as well, and we can measure the balance in this community, so this evolving nature in what we call a biodiversity index, which we're going to talk about more in another class, or another class session. But what we can do is we can keep track of the diversity of a particular community, and then we can see, well, how often can I mess with it? How often can I interrupt it and see what the resulting diversity is? And it turns out it makes almost a perfect parabola where you can have too few disturbances, or we can have too many disturbances. And the result is we don't have a lot of diversity. But if I go somewhere in the middle, I kind of max out the diversity. We call this the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. So it is a good thing to come in and kind of wreck a community, but not too often. The main reason why this is good is because it prevents ecological succession from maxing out. So ecological succession is when the community changes over time. It comes in two varieties. So you have one where you start with new soil. So this would be like um, a fire or you have a volcano and you have a lava field. So you're starting from scratch. Secondary succession is when we replace stuff. So like a pond becomes a meadow. So you're not really starting over, you're just changing what it turns out to be. All of these are going to eventually move into what we call a climax community or a climax state, and this is stagnant, meaning there's not a lot of diversity there because it's just a whole bunch of trees that aren't going to let anything else go on, you know, be there. So this is that too many, or sorry, not too many, but the too few. Because, sorry, there's nothing going on, so diversity plummets. So intermediate disturbance prevents this ecological succession from reaching its end. So, okay, so we have these communities, so why do we care? But what we can do is we can stick communities together, and we can combine... The community, which is the biotic, with the environment, which is the abiotic. So we can think of the biotic as the communities, and the abiotic as its environment. So the environment would be sunlight, no sunlight, hot, cold, windy, not windy, humid, dry, things like that. High pH, low pH. And it turns out every place you look on Earth is an ecosystem, because everywhere you look, there will be life, and you'll have non-life. 
If I zoom out far enough, I can see global versions of these ecosystems, and we call those biomes. And you've probably heard of some of these like a rainforest or a savanna or, you know, grasslands. When we look at these ecosystems, energy moves in them, and they all try to have what we call an energy budget, and we can account for all of that energy. It all starts with the sun in photosynthesis, and what we'll notice is as it moves from one thing eating it to something else, not all of it moves on. About 90% of that energy is going to go away as heat, and only about 10% sticks around. So there's only about a 10% transfer between these levels. And it turns out that we get some patterns. What we tend to get are, um, not older, but larger carnivores at the top of this chain. We also get tend to see fewer carnivores at the top of that particular chain. The energy looks something like this, where we could take those producers, so the niche being a producer, and they are going to produce so much energy. They are going to be consumed by what we call primary consumers, so these are going to be herbivores. And most of the energy is lost for going from producers to consumers. Well, the things that eat the herbivores are going to be carnivores, or the secondary consumers. And again, most of this one is going to get lost as heat. And you know, the things that eat the secondary consumers are also carnivores. And we're going to have even more loss of heat. So the energy plummets off really fast as we go from producers to the high end or the end of the eating chains that you can see. So if you wanted to get more energy, just go straight to the source. When you're dealing with energy, you also need to deal with matter because it turns out you, you can't have one without the other. And matter, like energy, also moves through communities. And the pattern of its motion is called a food web. So this is when we take our producers down here at the bottom, and we see, well, hey, what's eating the producers? Then the question becomes, well, what eats those things that eat the producers? And we can start getting these really horribly complex and convoluted patterns between everything. And these patterns overall is what we would call a food web. A food... Actually, that's right, because I didn't fix this. So, not food... If I were to look for a single path, this is called a food chain. So, a food chain, if I wanted to hunt for one of those, would be one of these individual paths, like what I just highlighted in blue. That would be an example of a food chain. There's a problem that happens with this, and that we saw here. That is, we get this loss of energy, which means these ones up here have to eat a lot. Like, these have to eat a lot. But not as much as these ones have to eat. So what we end up getting is a phenomenon that we call biological magnification, which is when toxins start to build up in these higher eating levels, so as we go from producers to herbivores to carnivores. So this here is an example of PCBs, which is a floral... Uh, um, I can't remember what PCB stands for. I'll, I'll put a little caption. But it's a, it's a toxin that turns out to be in the environment. It's uh, artificial estrogen, if I recall. What we see is as we start with producers, you know, they have so much of it. But as we go to things that eat that producers, you know, we might get a little bit more. And we'll go to the things that eat, you know, the herbivores, and they'll get a little bit more. Then we'll go to things that eat, you know, those, and we'll get a little bit more. And then we'll go to the next thing, and we'll get more. And before you know it, 
the amount of these toxins start to build up in the tissues. And that's because each time we build up and dump more and more and more into the next layer because they have to keep eating more and more and more in order to have enough energy to keep going. We also can look at that cycling of that matter, you know, through these food webs and food chains on a more global scale. So if I were to expand it from a community to an ecosystem, what I can now introduce is the environment into this energy recycling. So we will now have an oscillation between the living and the non-living for these particular nutrients. We call these, again, nutrient cycles or bio-geochemical cycles. And you've heard of some of these, like the water cycle or the carbon cycle. But there's other fancy ones like an oxygen cycle and a nitrogen cycle and a phosphorus cycle and a sulfur cycle. I don't care if you even know any of them. If you wanted to see them in your book, these are the figures to look at. But I'm not going to show them to you. I don't care if you remember them. What you should know is when we start talking about matter recycling on a global scale, that the environment now plays a role. And if we're now messing with the environment, that's going to affect us, and it's going to affect these cycles. So next time we're going to look at biodiversity, which is the ramification of basically everything we've been dealing with. There's also going to be a quiz, and hopefully you remember that you can make up quizzes.